Welcome everyone uh, to this breakout session for the MyCore conference. This is entitled, I collected lake data. Now, what does it mean? I'm sorry, I am reading the wrong one. <laughs> oh, help, help, I need help. How to recruit helpers for your monitoring outings. Um, despite not knowing what presentation we are, I do know our presenter here. Jason Frenzel has been a close worker with me for the last decade. Uh, he's been involved in multiple MyCore conferences, uh, lending his expertise on working with volunteers. Um, prior to that, uh, he, he worked with the city of Ann Arbor in a, a similar fashion, all about getting volunteers out and helping with uh, environmental activities. Uh, Jason actually uh, is a self-proclaimed tree hugging facilitator, right? It's, so that is that is what he does and he knows it well and he knows how people think and um, he always has good things to share about how to communicate and talk to others as we try to win them over to love the things that we love. So Jason, um, uh, go ahead and, well, actually before, before I turn it over to you officially, just everyone on, on chat, as you know, you can type in questions throughout uh, in the chat and I'll be monitoring that. And um, if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll get some of those answered. Okay, so with that little bit, Jason, take it away. Fabulous, thanks. Paul, this is the only place, the only conference, the only time where Paul lets us call him by doctor. At the office, we don't, don't get to do that, so I'm always delighted to be here. Um, our presentation today is about recruiting uh, help. I will um, be using the chat and an external web page called Jamboard to do some sort of group thinking through of some some ideas, um, but as we get started, I want to ask you all a question in the chat, if you would answer this. Um, thinking of some times that you have uh, volunteered somewhere, it doesn't have to be an environmental activity, any sort of activity, um, and you returned to that activity, you went back to that organization um, or that, that thing, why uh, what, what made you return to that activity? What was it about that, that experience that got you to go back? Um, this, uh, a huge portion of the conversation today will be about um, making sure that people um, have a good time so that um, while, um, while we will be talking a fair amount about recruitment, and that'll be the biggest section of our chat today, um, I want to impress upon everybody that having a good experience and having people come back is far less laborious for us um, as individual uh, Laker stream monitors or as organizational representatives. Um, keeping the people that come through our door is, um, is far more efficient for us. Um, so please uh, feel free to use the chat function there. Oh frame um, the rest of the conversation about um, how we work with volunteers in sort of the idea of a quality experience, um, making sure that our volunteers, uh, when they show up, um, feel like they have had uh, a good time, contributed to something um, useful, um, like their time was well spent, um, that they uh, enjoyed themselves in the way that they felt like they wanted to be in, enjoying themselves. Um, that means different things to different folks, of course. Um, interestingly, um, we, when, we, when we look at having a, having a good time under somebody else's auspices, oftentimes when we're planning that time, we struggle with making sure that both the time is structured well so that people understand that they're having, it, that they're, they're part of something that is meaningful and thought through. Um, but we also want to be flexible at the same time because the folks that come to us have different constraints and different issues in their lives. Um, and so that balance point um, between consistency and structure and flexibility um, is, a, is a very unique decision to the organization or to the leader 
Um, interestingly, when Paul and I work together, um, sometimes he's really flexible and I'm not, and sometimes it's vice versa. Um, and so it works out really well for us um, to co-balance those events that we work on together. Um, and I would impress upon you also through this presentation, getting more people's thoughts and ideas um, to buffer whatever preferences you tend to make in your decision-making or your planning engagement um, is, um, is of, of great value. Because um, while we're all somewhat um, empathetic, none of us can be all things empathetic. Um, great ideas of um, why folks went back. Thanks for dropping those in the chat. <clears throat> um, so the idea of having a quality experience is in some ways really intangible. And so what I'm gonna try to impress upon you again today are a bunch of different concepts um, and some very specific ideas on how to get to these goals um, of ensuring that everybody that comes through our door or the helpers that we have when we go out, um, be it our grandson, like Craig Keevy's presentation just now, um, or someone we don't know um, and, and, and know very, very little about, making sure that they are stacking the deck in such a way that ensures that they're likely to have a good time and therefore want to come back. And so I would say, again, I would say that all of these other components of the presentation are factors in creating a good experience, a positive um, experience for the folks that work with us or volunteer with us. The first concept that I want to talk about is motivational factors. This is um, sort of there's a bunch of different theories of human motivation. Um, can think about some, some old school versions like Haslow's, Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. Um, there's all sorts of different psychological sort of theory here. Um, and this is a, a sort of concept that I brought together based on what I've seen and the research that I've done on other people, the, the looking into other people's research that I've done. Um, and basically I like to break individual um, motivation into five sort of concepts. One is impact, which is our primary mode of interacting, right? We're getting, the, we're making the world a better place. Um, and likely a lot of folks that are coming out to us want to also. So we wanna make sure that that is far, forefront in their experience and what they're gaining from their time with us. However, any individual's um, motivational factors may come and go based on their day or um, as they evolve over time, year to year. And so making sure that our um, outings, our volunteer um, events, hit on multiple different motivational factors will likely impress a more positive experience on them. Um, and so making sure that folks have an opportunity um, to socialize, create social bonds and networks. Um, this is important um, in general, but also here in Southeast Michigan, we have uh, a lot of folks who are very transient. Um, and so that's really useful in those situations. And it's also great for folks who, um, who are getting older and are looking for or any number of reasons why folks might be looking to expand their social network. Um, to learn and to teach our opposite sides of the coin, um, these are sort of obvious. We're sort of always learning and growing individuals. And so getting, getting and learning something um, gets the cogs to start moving. And, um, and teaching is sort of the reciprocal of that, showing mastery um, is of value. Um, and then power is one that doesn't really fit into our volunteer events so much. It fits more so in the idea of um, like boards and commissions and things of that nature, um, though I will touch on it at, right at the end of this presentation. Um, and then there's also the all, all present food uh, common denominator of all of our experiences. And we um, I've long since believed if you are working with somebody out in the field for more than an hour or two, you should provide some water and food um, or make sure that that's available in some way or another. Um, breaking bread together is also a very good format of um, creating social cohesion. Um, when you have, when you work with groups of volunteers, groups of individuals or corporate groups, their reason for volunteering may be slightly different than individuals, um, such as team building, service learning, um, or some sort of uh, community recognition, something that we often call uh, greenwashing in, in some cases. 
Um, but these are, um, if you have corporations or service clubs or universities with sororities and fraternities in your area, um, these are great um, methods for getting folks, um, getting folks involved. Um, I want to step back from that concept just a little bit and think about it from, think about structuring the volunteer's experience um, in, a, in a sort of structural method and an easy way to think about that is through the concept of a job description. Now, um, I wouldn't suggest that if you're going to have somebody come out and um, hold your secchi disc once a month with you, uh, that you need to write up a job description necessarily, um, but thinking through some of the components of what we get out of the experience and what types of um, skills we have to have is of value in recruiting the right helpers, the right volunteers. <clears throat> So these are all the <clears throat> components of a job description, but when we're when we're doing um, recruitment, especially when it's sort of um, low key recruitment um, or word of mouth recruitment, I would suggest that the the points that I've underlined here are are still of exceptional value. Um, making sure that you are very clear <coughs> about the commitment and the abilities of the individual. If you overplay or downplay the commitment too much um, folks the folks that are involved with each other will have very different expectations of what the uh, event or the um the time together will be and that's a great way to create problems um both in creating potential frustration but also um i have i have uh in my own past uh, when i was early on in recruiting volunteers i i accidentally set the bar far too low for some events and I got um, I got people who were way more enthusiastic than they than they should have been. They had far they believed they had far too much autonomy. It was the only time I've ever had to fire volunteers, um, and so it was a great learning lesson for me to make sure that um, I'm very clear that we're very clear and specific about what the requirements are. <clears throat> Similarly, articulating the work, um, we do a benthic study um, three times a year at the Huron. And we regularly get um, parents who ask if their kids can come out and volunteer. And our benthic study is fully family um, friendly. And I, I'd say to the parents that call and ask, they're like, well, I've got an eight-year-old. Is the eight-year-old able to come out? And obviously from, from Craig's example, you know, his 10-year-old son's able to go out on a boat and do a secchi disc. Of, co of course, that's appropriate. Um, I've seen three-year-olds who can do do benthic studies, and I've seen 30-year-olds who don't have the ability to hold their attention for that 30 minutes that's necessary to be in the field. Um, and so it's really up to the individual. Um, but being able to clearly articulate what the work is is the first step there. Um, and then getting back to that motivational force of creating impact, being able to describe very succinctly but specifically what the benefit and value of the work is. Um, and that might that might also be to the individual if you're getting college students who want to come to learn how to do the scientific study, but also the benefit to, to nature, what the what the study is going to be doing, a la um, our, our first presentation um, this morning um, from, um, I'm going to have to look it up, I forgot, uh, Dr. Noner um, talking about, um, you know, all of the use that they do with our data. So, um, <clears throat> Moving on, I wanted to get everybody to jump over onto the internet. There's a, as, as folks have ever done an experience, so just click that hyperlink in the um, in the chat. Um, this is a sticky note exercise, so we're basically brainstorming ideas together. Now I'll go through some specifics that I've written up, but I wanted to get everybody to drop a few ideas into here. On the left hand side, there's a little square button that's a sticky note. You click that and you get to choose your color of a sticky note. And just put one idea on each. There's there's four pages. And you can see on the top, there's um the four pages you can toggle between them, and they're they're different locations to do recruitment. So word of mouth, um, I added this example of asking your uh, existing volunteers to bring a buddy. Um so um, just go in and place a sticky note on each of the um, on each of the um, four pages with some ideas that you have or experiences that you've had, either recruiting by word of mouth, like one to one, or direct recruitment, 
Um, online recruitment locations is the second page. Uh, traditional media locations is the third page. And the last one is uh, groups or organizations to partner with. Nice, somebody already dropping in student organizations. I wonder how many folks have a local paper still. We do, we no longer have a local paper in half of our communities that we serve. <clears throat> Oh yeah, Facebook groups, that's great. Yep. And I'll let you guys continue to add things here while I talk a little bit. Um, and I will also leave this Jamboard open going forward. So if you all want to continue to add things to it um, throughout the presentation or afterwards, we can um, grab ideas from each other um, going forward. It'd be great if you added things, especially that were successful for you in the past. <clears throat> So some specific uh, recruitment processes that I've um, that I've used uh, successfully, and sometimes sometimes less than successfully, but that's the, it's all all about learning and growing. I also wanted to add a bunch of things. Looking um, looking at where we're all from, where we represent a huge swath of Michigan um, at this conference, and so I wanted to add things that were likely going to be val of value to. Um, uh, to folks in all sorts of different situations, be them up north or more rural or or the opposites. <clears throat> so first and foremost, um, if you have people working with you, and I think this gets to a lot of the points that were just made uh, in this in the jam board uh, from word of mouth, um, recruiting through existing networks. Um, if you have volunteers, um, making sure that you um, ask them to bring a friend or a family or utilize the process of um, recruiting through your own networks if, if it's just you. Um, the We, when Paul and I recruit folks, we'll do a lot of sort of very outward focus, focused recruitment. And then in the last minutes before an event, like just the last handful of days before an event, if we still have some more open slots, we will email all of the volunteers who have registered for the event and say, oh, by the way, um, if you hadn't thought about it or we still have a few open slots, make sure that you bring a friend or family member uh, if you're inclined to or a coworker. Um, that um, invitation to allow them to share their own network um, impresses upon them that the event is very sort of informal and, um, and friendly in nature, which is of value to a lot of folks. But even more so, if a new volunteer brings along a loved one or a coworker or something, the likelihood of them having a sort of layering those different types of motivational um, forces on top of each other is higher. Uh, that is to say, they're likely to have a a sort of social bonding experience with their own known uh, friends and family associated with the event, therefore associating a much more positive experience with our event or organization. <clears throat> um, we definitely recruit a bunch of um, skills-based volunteers. Here's a gentleman named Bill. He's on our large woody debris team, um, which is primarily uh, taking canoes and kayaks down creeks to remove unsafe passage locations, um, only in locations where we need to do it due to the user base. Um, but of course, um, asking and trying to figure out where we can find somebody who knows how to use chainsaws well enough to use one in a boat is, um, is, a, is, a, is a recruitment, um, very specific recruitment situation. Similarly, uh, about five years ago, we conducted a organizational oral history project um, with a bunch of volunteers and found found somebody who had done a bunch of um, history work um, and then and then a bunch of students who wanted to do a bunch of transcribing. Um, and so networking your way into those skills-based volunteers um, is a, sort of a magical thing. 
mostly for our monitoring programs. We don't need that, but it depends on what you're what you're getting what you're getting yourself into, of course. Um, schools uh, was mentioned in one of the jam boards. Um, definitely, um, you know, we'll work with uh, junior high students pretty regularly. Um, some of our peer organizations work with elementary school students. Um, we often have high school groups come out and volunteer with us at our larger events. Um, I find that having a strong connection with one or two teachers is the most valuable thing because they will be the ones that promote it with their own students. Um, and I also keep a list of all of the science teachers in our watershed um, so I can uh, send them a note whenever we're having large events and just remind them that this is a very um, science oriented um, event. They can learn biology and water chemistry, uh, earth sciences. And um, oh, by the way, some teachers offer extra credit for this and to motivate their students to get out. And um, it tends to get one or two groups of uh, small groups of students per event. Um, we do have a lot of schools in our area, though. Um, similarly, environmental organizations, um, there's there's so many different uh, groups of folks. Um, you know, we have we have Great Lakes and watershed and streamshed organizations all throughout the state. Um, we also interestingly have state officials who live in our communities all over the place. Um, you know, I've had many of the people who are presenting at this conference come out and volunteer with us because they wanted to learn something about what um, what we're doing and how we do it. And so going to people who, who are considered the expert and allowing them to come and volunteer with us side by side with us, um, there's nothing wrong with that. They, they bring a certain expertise um, and we bring the local know-how. <clears throat> um, obviously recreationalists, um, if you, we have a really strong Trout Unlimited group here in this sort of Ann Arbor, Washtenaw area. They've, they're a great partner. Um, we also have lots of avid paddling um, in, the, in the Huron. Um, and so partnering with the liveries and the outfitters um, is a great place for us to, to recruit folks from. Um, and again, uh, corporate or, uh, or, or groups and organizations, um, depending on your community, um, you know, we have some we have some corporations who have semi mandatory volunteering. It's more the larger organizations, but some of the new small organizations have a, um, companies have sort of that like in, environmental and social sort of um, uh, infrastructure or belief system. And so, getting out and helping in the community, we had a couple of groups of. Um, clothing, a couple groups come from clothing stores in the mall in the last two years, which was, which was very interesting to me. Um, they're just wanting to get out and do good work. Um, their mission and our mission don't seem to align, but their personnel's values do. <clears throat> um, and then there's court ordered service. If you have a um, if you if you have a court system in your municipality or nearby, um, there's often court ordered service, you would approach the um, um, uh, the folks who do who manage the, the parolees or the or the um, the folks who are ordered to do service. Um, I can't remember the name of the, the position now. Um, if you think of it, you can put it in the chat for me. Um, and by the way, yes, this is a picture of Dr. Paul Steen in the bottom right. I, um, I like, you know, just throwing his picture around in inappropriate locations like court ordered service. Um, then we go to, thanks Paul, glad that still makes you laugh. Um, uh, then we go to online volunteer recruitment. There's just tons of locations. I find they all work a little bit. Um, so I typically have an intern post our events on these sort of things. Um, uh, yeah, and I find, I find often all of them work a little bit. It just really depends on your community, I would test run any number of them and then and see if some of them resonate for your geographic location. Um, and if they don't, then then skip it. Um, I'm, I'm in a group at the Sierra Club here and we find really, really good recruitment through Meetup, which I forgot to put on here. Um, Meetup is just a, a sort of outings related social media. Um, 
and then sort of more traditional um, avenues of getting the word out. Um, again, I, I wonder how many of us have local newspapers and local television um, that we can access. I know that there are certainly <coughs> significant parts of the state that still do, um, but in the I think in the bigger um, in some of the bigger markets we don't have that anymore. Um, yeah, so those are all all of the sort of basic ideas of recruitment locations. Let me go back and see what else. Um, share announcements, ask volunteers, science teachers and their students, aquatic entomology school. Mm -hmm. Yep, somebody put me up on there. Great job. Community calendars. Call local DJ nights. Uh, in the newspaper and the radio bulletin boards. When I worked at the city, we would post flyers at like a hundred different locations around town on businesses bulletin boards. Uh, not just like outfitters and outdoor store places, like anybody who would let us do it. Um, and they'd all work a little bit. Um, nice. Other groups, churches, absolutely. Um, I find for myself, um, it's, it's, it's been easier to go through somebody who already is associated with the church to try to do that outreach at the church. Um, so pulling your existing uh, network or volunteers. Um, Scouts, National Honor Society is great. Um, there are a suite of sort of semi-mandatory volunteering at the school level at this point um, that, can work, that can work very well. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to move on for time purposes. Um, I wanted to go through these last handful of points fairly quickly um, because I, I know that a lot of our um, sort of infrastructure, um, the ways that we work out in the field, um, the folks who are uh, at the conference sometimes is, is like only a couple people or a very small organization. Um, and so this idea of sort of application screening and placement of volunteers is not applicable. Um, however, I would again say that this process of like, how do you think through putting the right person into the right position um, so that you make sure that you're loading the deck so that you everybody has a good experience and they're more likely to come back. Um, the idea of putting the right person in the wrong place or the wrong person in the right place, um, or however they say that, um, is guaranteed to have a bad experience for one and or all. Um, and this pro pro process of placement is, a, is for more traditional or bigger uh, volunteer programs, a very critical component of that. Um, and, and maybe the reciprocal of that is to say, if you have a volunteer who's not having a great time doing a particular activity, perhaps that's just not the right activity for them, um, pivoting, who they're working with, what locations they're going to. Um, the, if you're doing multiple different types of activities, then having them do different things. Um, for example, um, sampling from shore is really different than sampling off of a kayak is really different than sampling from a float boat of some sort. Um, and if a person is, um, is leery or uncomfortable in one of those situations physically for some reason, um, that might be a good thing to to identify in the, in the sort of placement and evaluation process. Um, to that point, um, as I noted earlier, I think evaluation is, is super critical. Um, it's not, it doesn't always have to be a formal, like a, a paper form that people fill out, especially if it's just like you and a couple of buddies uh, or you and a buddy who's then recruited a neighbor. Um, obviously having them fill out a form isn't, isn't necessary for an evaluation at that point, but asking and talking through how things went, what went well and, and should be kept and what could be improved upon and how is a really informal way to, to nicely open up that conversation. Um, we do a, a STEM education, a youth education program, and it's, it, the team starts to feel like a family by the end of, um, by the end of each season, because they see each other so many times. And so filling out a, a formal uh, evaluation would be awkward. Um, but we stand around in a circle after we've worked with 20 or 200 students in a day. And then that team of like five or eight 
educators will just go around and say, what, what worked? What did, what did I love about today? Um, what did I learn today that I want to continue doing or do, do better? And, and what, are the, what are the things that you could do without or that you would like to try and improve upon? Um, and we, we try not to have it be like, oh, the leader needs to do something different. We try to have it formed in a, you know, what could we work on to, to improve this for the students? Um, and translating that into a, a learning environment for our own outings for doing water quality sampling is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and again, creates that creates that cohesion in the group. Um, and it can, as I, as I like to say, turn lemons into lemonade. If somebody has a bad experience and they get to then pivot that bad experience into the opportunity to fix it and they get involved in the fixing, they you, you change somebody's experience from probably not wanting to come back to having an excuse and a reason to come back to do the improvement. Um, and so that, that, um, that shifting of that um, potentially negative experience um, can be really transformational in the experience and the, the longevity of some of, your, some of your helpers and volunteers. <clears throat> um, I like this idea of a focus group or key advice. Um, oftentimes when I find a volunteer who I think is gonna be like really good, um, I will pull them aside every time I see them and ask them um, something that's, that is particular to their ability or their experience. Um, an easy one is if I have volunteers who are starting to take a leadership role, doing things on their own a little bit, um, or working independently with another volunteer, I will ask them for advice and thoughts about how to improve that situation. What, did, what worked out there between the two of you or multiple of you? How, how what, what can we do? What can I do? What can you and I do together to improve that situation? So when you go and do that thing again, you're gonna be better at it um, or you're, you'll have better tools. And that often gets folks into a location where they start to build a personal relationship or a stronger bond with the leader, the organization, and they start to see themselves in a more significant role um, doing that work, which, um, which again, uh, uh, added, added responsibility often adds um, people's um, in, interest in coming back. Um, obviously, the last one of the last things that we want to talk about is appreciation. Um, I've got another jam board for appreciation. I know some of you put it in the beginning also, but if you want to jump over to this web page and add a few things of ideas on how to um, how we might appreciate folks when they come out. Um, that would be great. It could be things that you've experienced um, or, um, or things that you've done. T-shirts and hats, absolutely. One of the things I like to think about when we think about appreciation is that the, um, the type of appreciation, appreciation we give has to be commensurate with the type of activity and the activity level that they, that they inputted with us, right? If somebody comes out once or twice, um, what you might give them as a thank you is going to be very different than if somebody comes out for years after years after years. Um, so back to my presentation, um, if you want to do both at the same time, um, T-shirts, water bottles, tchotchkes, they're great. Oh, native seeds, that's a great idea. Um, appreciation events, we like to have, I don't know if everybody in the state likes to do this, but we really like to have potlucks, um, little thank you, lunch and breakfast sort of things. Um, we always have a yearly awards event um, where we thank some of our volunteers um, with big, so a little bit of a bigger splash. Um, that might not be appropriate for everybody. Um, placing things into a newsletter or websites. Um, definitely, uh, I like sending thank you notes um, or letters. Um, and then I think a lot of times just, you know, when folks are out with us for a couple hours, just saying thanks. And it was really great to meet you. And, you know, in a heartfelt way, like I, it was really, it was really interesting to get to know you and your experience. Um, that was really valuable um, in, in being authentic in that space um, of appreciation. 
The last thing I wanted to bring up um, in our conversation today is this concept of the ladder of engagement. If your if your if your programs are structured in such a way where people can take on um, a little bit of leadership as they go in time, prove themselves, it can be really valuable um, to give folks, as I noted before, a little bit more um, uh, responsibility. Um, similarly, if you're running or involved in multiple different programs, if if you have different programs that people can sort of cross pollinate and go go from one to the other, um, folks that might might be more likely to find the thing that they're more interested in if they get an opportunity to try out a few different types of activities. Um, that's that's usually more for the formal organizations or folks that are involved in in multiple monitoring, multiple types of monitoring programs. Um, that's what I had to present, um, Mr. Steen. Um, I am happy to answer any questions um, or go back to these jam boards because they're full of full of good ideas. Thank you all for sharing. Um, questions from folks or anything that anybody would like to comment on? Yep, feel free to use the chat to do so. Nothing anyway. right now but I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, here's something from Kyle Hart. How often do you see repeat volunteers versus new volunteers per event? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I can give you some data and off the cuff information for the, for the Huron. I would um, preface that by saying it's really different based on what your program structure is. Um, so, like formal organizations like the watershed councils that we have throughout the state or in a bunch of places in the state, um, our recruitment and retention rate might be really different. Um, and that also might be very different than if you're, um, if it's just a handful of people doing monitoring on a lake. Um, we will have year after year after year, we'll have 50% retention. Um, there are plenty of programs where 50% retention would seem abysmally low, um, but we have six colleges and universities in our main county. And so we, one of our goals is to make our programs accessible to, is, to lots of folks who are up and coming professionals. And, um, and so we, it, it is an expressed goal of some of our program managers to allow for that throughput. People to come like once or maybe twice um, or definitely lots of folks who come for a year or two and then don't come back. And, and we find that that's okay, as long as we have the right number of people who do come back to support that, those new folks um, in, in the program delivery. Okay. Uh, Ashley is asking uh, what you have found to be your best technology to manage volunteer contacts, that's or how do you contact them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, again, uh, really different scale depending on your infrastructure. Um, it is great and super fine to use a spreadsheet if you've got a dozen or a hundred folks that you're working with. Um, it, and that would be, in my mind, a case where you're, you're monitoring a lake and you need two helpers a year and you've got a set of 20 or 50 people that you, you call and ask and, and, and some of them come out here and there and some of them are, are, are on really heavy for a year and not, not for another year. Um, our, the, the Huron, we're sort of a mid-level organization. Um, I have, we've got plenty of peers who are at the national level who are 10 times bigger than we are, but we've got a database of a two to 4,000 volunteers and a and an equal number of people who have expressed interest in volunteering but have yet got to get involved um so we need something that can curate that data um, a bit better and track and we're also really heavy data geeks um not suggesting that pro pro probably a lot of people at the conference are um but um but we also want to be able to follow those volunteers through time with us. And so we use a, a CRM, a it's like a constituent management um, software based off of Salesforce. It's a, it's a software set that's used in large corporations. I wouldn't recommend it unless you have the ability to have somebody who's really dedicated to database management. Um, and you wanna integrate 
the reason that we went with it is because it's um, volunteers, donors, corporations, things like that. Um, there are a couple off the shelf databases like Vologistics and Volmatch um, that are really fairly straightforward. Um, you just buy a package, um, but all of those all of those databases have ongoing costs associated with them also. Emily has a longer question, Jason. I don't know if you can see your chat and want to read through that. <clears throat> if you have any thoughts on helping the brand new volunteers. Yeah, um, so a few things. One, um, a huge portion or success of our quality assurance plan for our data is about um, making sure that our training for our long-term volunteers is at a certain level. It's very specific. It's consistent over time. Um, it, it's so consistent over time, Paul and I hate giving the presentation because it's the same, it's so similar. Um, yeah. Because we need them to practice exactly, they, they need to do the exact same monitoring year after year, even if they're different individuals. Um, and so that consistency, both the individuals and the training, and they, they have to go through retraining every three years also. So that's a huge portion. Um, we also, um, when we recruit new volunteers, we explain to them a bit. Prior, um, we, we, we describe to them what the event will be like, and we tell them that they have to be very careful about how the data is collected and following the lead of these trained volunteers. Um, we do actually provide, in some ways, all of the materials. They, they could piece together everything and how to do it through the materials that we provide to the new volunteers. And uh, just recently with the pandemic, we did a video of, of basically what the event looks like and how to, how to be ready for the event. Um, so they, they have the ability to see all of the components. And the paperwork all uh, redoubles how the process is supposed to work, you know, all the sampling locations, the amount of time it takes, the procedures are, are very detailed. And the new volunteers have access to it. It's, it's emailed to them. Um, they can see it when they're out in the field. Um, so it's not, the, the, the process is, has a lot of redundancy in, in how and ensuring that the data creation is consistent. Paul, did I did I do that justice? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of brand new volunteers, you kind of said it, but the, um, you know, we always give them some kind of onboarding, even though it's it can be really quick, but we make sure that they go out there having a good sense of what they're going to do. But we we do rely a lot on those team leaders to do yeah. the on site training. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this gets back to the, and I'll, I'll close with this because it's time to move over, but it gets back to that first point that I was trying to make is like, we, we need to have consistency for the data, for data's sake. And we, so we need to have structure to our, our programming and how we implement, uh, whether, whether we're doing a really small set of water bodies or a very extensive, either way, we need to be very concrete in that process. And at the same time, we still need to be flexible enough to, to have, have the volunteers have a good time. Like we need, we need to interject that like super data heavy process oriented with fun. And like, how, how do you, yeah, we, we have to get there somehow or another. Um, usually I, I play the fool and Paul plays the doctor and it, um, and it works out great. Um, we, we, a little, uh, a little yin and yang for, for that. Um, but however, whatever works for you to make sure that you can get both of those goals done at the same time. Um, we try to provide that to our leaders, our trained volunteers, like make it your own. So that you're ensuring that the people that come to you are having a good time. I think we're at time, Paul. We are. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and hang up and uh, head to the last portion of the agenda for the day. We'll see you guys over there. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everybody.